Hi, my name is Dennis. Welcome to Foundation's AWS Operational Security Best Practices. Let's go ahead and get started. Our learning objectives today include identifying critical threat services for various application architecture among your workloads. So pretty much, we wanna make sure we threat model everything that we're uh, performing before we put it into a production environment. We also wanna learn about the NIST incident handling model, also uh, the, com comp the comparison SANS model for incident handling and response, and how identity uh, Amazon Web Services and security services work with each other at each phase of this model. We also wanna apply AWS security controls for common architecture and patterns in the console with automated remediation as part of our demonstration. All right, let's get started. So threat modeling fundamentals, what does it mean to threat model? Well, the main thing about threat modeling is that you're wanting to capture every possible area for whatever your risk surface may be. So if you have an EC2 instance, for instance, if you have that instance, you might be running in a public subnet, a private subnet, you naturally have ports open if you want that internet facing. So from a network security perspective, you have an open exposure that requires mitigation and compensating controls, firewall rule requirements, intrusion prevention systems that actually stop exploits from vulnerabilities, uh, sometimes otherwise known as virtual patching, the OS hardening of the service itself, as well as application penetration testing that has to occur for testing your code and everything that goes with it. So the more that you're responsible at the lower infrastructure side and not managed by Amazon Web Services, remember that AWS security of the cloud is managed by AWS. Security in the cloud is still managed by you. So we'll keep those in mind as we move forward with our threat modeling concepts. So before we threat model, we have to understand some common security frameworks. These frameworks are around cybersecurity best practices, as well as some regulatory requirements. We have the NIST, which is National Institute of Science and Technology Cybersecurity Framework, High Trust Cybersecurity Framework, and the PCI DSS, which stands for Payment Card Industry Data Security Standard, which is a regulatory requirement, as well as a framework in itself. Ultimately, the NIST Cybersecurity Framework focuses around the incident response of identifying, protecting, detection, and response and recovery of any kind of cybersecurity incident or event related to any kind of systems. Of all these frameworks, the PCI DSS provides the most prescriptive guidance, but we also wanna make sure you align yourself into the AWS well-architected uh, what best practices, the pillars, as well as the cloud adoption framework and you wanna make sure the controls are in lockstep with each other and so that you're also providing the best value add and security baked into the process as part of our requirements when creating workloads. Just a brief overview that the NIST cybersecurity framework, identify, protect, detect, respond, and recover all have different work stream requirements. Uh, we have different inventorying, just like we did with migration patterns when you move into AWS, you also want to protect these items with preventive-based controls. You have detective-based controls, and you need to be able to respond to them accordingly in a timely fashion, and also be able to recover from any kind of cybersecurity attacks. Now, while all these seem very trivial from the top level down, it gets a little, a little bit more difficult to implement based on the actual controls you need for your actual workload in the environment. To help you with that, understand that the NIST cybersecurity framework it's a combination of other security architecture best practices built by the community over time and vetted by multiple members uh, of our community. Regulatory requirements and practices and even business objectives help feed into the NIST CSF itself and what you should be at in a capabilities maturity model for security. You need to define your security objectives and outcomes, and then you want to provide targeted input towards the profile and then align yourself to the well-architected framework and the cloud adoption framework as previously mentioned and understand where those two align. So if you overlay one with the other and you have controls that match up, you should utilize the controls that actually match up so you can get your continuous improvement and continuous integration of that model. The main thing is that remember that there's always gonna be overlap between the NIST CSF and the well-architected framework as well as the cloud adoption framework 
every best practice is part of that. And remember, security is always integral at every step of the process. So some of these frameworks that you look at from a high level overview and requirement, I trust is one of the cybersecurity frameworks, but it's not a regulation. In fact, it actually helps you achieve a certain level of attestation against what's called the HIPAA or the Health, uh, Informa the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act. This was created and creates a security and privacy ruling that requires a certain level of cybersecurity uh, degree. The high trust framework sits on top of that regulation and helps understand which actual controls need to be put in place. There's a total of 19 domains, uh, anywhere from the actual information or data protection itself, all the way down to privacy and fiscal environment. So these are all different things when you think about how you can align the cloud adoption framework and the AWS well architected framework in itself. Think about this. If you're looking at data protection and privacy, what does protection mean? Well, you might also think about the CIA triad, which is confidentiality, integrity, and availability of your data or any system for that matter. When you're talking about data, confidentiality usually means encryption. When you're talking about integrity, right, the protection of that data, you're usually thinking about the possibility of data modification. So least privileges required and ultimately understanding what has changed in the Delta. So that could be uh, file hashing or any other uh, way of measuring deltas between changing of bytes of sp specific data. You also have availability. And this actually kind of runs into the physical and environment security as well for domains 18 and 19. Availability could mean uh, AWS AZs, multiple AZs, multiple region replication. And so when you convert these control requirements, they actually do quite a bit overlap each other with the, also the um, AWS well architected framework. So please keep this in mind um, as you consolidate accordingly based on your enterprise organizational needs. Now, let's talk a little bit about PCI DSS. Now, PCI DSS is actually a security standard as well as a regulational requirement for all things uh, when you take a look at payment card industry data security standard. And right now at the time of this recording, we're at version 3.2. This also includes penetration testing, which we say in domains 10 and 11. Um, let's try to get my pin back up and running. Domains 10 and 11, and it's moved forward. Let's try this one last time. And let's get this pin back up and running. There we go. So regulatory requirements um, and regulatory monitoring test networks, penetration testing, but also mean data detection incident response, all go into here. And so when we think about credit card transactions, not just credit cards, but debit cards, anything that has a swipe, insert a chip, or even wireless transaction through RFID, if it has to do with a credit card or debit card, PCI DSS is in play. It's an actual standard and a regulatory requirement uh, all over the world. So anything with Visa, MasterCard, Amex, doesn't matter. Uh, they're the ones who led this originally. And it has 12 main domains at a high level overview. Uh, originally, it was one of the most prescriptive guidance uh, based items here and frameworks. And the, frame, the standard itself it actually acts as a framework. So you have steps one through 12, really. And the level of your requirement depends on the number of transactions that you do. A tier one might be something like Amazon Web Services, where they take credits, card payments, and transactions from millions of people every second. Uh, a mom and pop shop might be a little bit different. They might be uh, a tier three or something of lower nature, and you might need only a certain level of attestation and self um, governance when, when it comes to that. So the more you process, the more security requirements there are, and it actually scales with that. And you can also align some of these um, into the best practices of your well architected framework and review. Now, now that we understand a little bit more about regulatory frameworks and policies, we want to actually start thinking about logical flows. So before we do any form of threat uh, analysis and threat modeling creation, we just create a diagram of what we're making, the architecture itself. I've created a single EC2 instance in a public subnet, single VPC with an inter internet gateway. Notice I have no other items attached to it. We already have some areas of concern. 
a denial of service. And although we have AWS Shield, we don't have AWS Shield Advanced, which actually um, acts as a 24 by 7 monitoring service for any kind of denial of service attack. We also have to worry about EC2's patching and hardening at the same time. Um, and it's just, it's just really uh, cumbersome at the same time to do so. Oh, well, there goes my mouse again. Let's try this one last time. There we go. And so OS patching and hardening is also a requirement. And then because we have direct internet access to the ports, perhaps port 80 or 443 for a web server, we have to also think about encryption at rest and in flight. Encryption at rest being the EBS encryption volumes, which is at minimum there. Encryption in flight might be, do we terminate our own TLS or SSL encryption? Those are things that we need to think about as well as uh, ACLs for the network access controls and security groups on the actual instances themselves. That's a lot to consider. And on top of having your application security concerns at the same time. Hence, we go back to our thought about going to microservices, managed service offering di uh, distinction and serverless whenever possible. Now, some of the components required when you do some threat modeling and you consider your architecture as a whole, remember that you're doing threat modeling at the very beginning. You don't wanna be doing this after you've built something. Always do so with every piece of practicality at the beginning of your design. And when you threat model something, you need to understand where the data flows start and stop. So make sure that you work backwards from the perspective of the end user and the data producers and consumers of everything. Map, that up, map out the uh, bi-directional or single directional areas, as well as security trust zones, right? If you see that curve here that you're saying, I'm doing a different security zone of trust. I'm leaving the AWS VPC environment to perhaps a lower trust level or a higher trust level. You have to make that determination when you make these diagrams. In general, the more the better, the more details you can be able to provide, especially to the security architecture team, the better they can help you with your risk analysis. So remember, all entities producing and consuming data security trust boundaries, data flow direction, make sure you delineate between all of them above. What does the threat model actually look like at a level one area? Well, the most generic threat models doesn't have to be AWS specific. We go back to the other slide, we actually see that we're using AWS specific technologies um, in that modeling, which is a great combination to use in your threat modeling. However, when you utilize tool sets, they may have only a certain amount of limited models um, and icons that go with it. Still the same principles apply. Every entity, every data consumer, a process, trust boundaries. And as you can see here, it's a very similar uh, pattern. Unidirectional versus bidirectional, trust boundaries, where the data asset sits, how it gets moved in, uh, in motion. And you can utilize, utilize tools for this and methods. So methodologies are based on what you need, like Microsoft Stride is a very uh, popular one. Spoofing, tempering, repudiation, which means uh, can the dentist do it or was it possibly the student? Repudiation might be in terms of certificates or uh, public, uh, public keys. Information disclosure, denial of service, and of course, privilege escalation itself if you actually compromise something, also known as post-exploit. There's also POSTA, which stands for Process for Tax Simulation and Threat Analysis. So almost like threat hunting, but only in reverse. So you're actually trying to think like an attacker and go up these different attack simulation trees and playbooks to see if it has an effect on your, uh, your environment and your workload that you're actually preparing. Now, some interesting tools which are free that are generic threat modeling tools are the OWASP Threat Dragon, which focuses on web server, web services-based threat modeling, which is most of what you'll see in Amazon Web Services. There's also the Microsoft Threat Modeling Tool, which also focuses, although on Azure, not AWS, you can make it more generic and see where your risks are when you have uh, perhaps threat models and applications that look a little bit like this at, the, at a higher level overview rather than a specific technology overview. Please keep that in mind. Utilize these tools when you're going through the labs or also whenever you're going through um, studying your material because you'll want to do this as you design your payload and your workloads together before you actually start building. This is really important at the architecture level that security is job zero at Amazon Web Services. And it's really for the protection of not just customers, but for yourself from actual litigation issues for being non-compliant or having a breach uh, related to a weakness in your threat model security that you didn't account for. So when we have a threat model, ultimately we need to measure risk, 
risk is the combination of vulnerability times threat. And of course, your impact. What's your blast radius if something would happen? Risk is really about the probability of threat times your vulnerability. Your threat is a potential entity to exploit said vulnerability. So for instance, what is my level of risk of Houston, Texas flooding? Well, usually pretty high because why? The vulnerability is most of our houses are built around uh, the, the lower seashore area. The threat is that we have flooding to begin with based on heavy storms or uh, some other issues. And our impact is going to be high because it's based on my dwelling of living. And so based on all of that, the probability is high. And so we have to account accordingly either with compensating controls or uh, perhaps security-based insurance like flood insurance coverage for aftermath of this. Ultimately, you want to reduce the probability of a successful attack, but you also want to be able to protect what makes sense using the resources you have uh, for the best optimized value add. And ultimately, that's why you threat model. You want to measure the risk at each component whenever possible and make a determinant on what kind of compensated controls you can do and what kind of controls you can do without, without breaking compliance or the actual frameworks that apply to your organization. Hence, PCI DSS for credit card related items, uh, high trust and HIPAA for uh, healthcare related workloads. These are all different things that you must consider. So consult your compliance team, consult with your uh, office of the general counsel, as well as the security team for better guidance on this. All right, so let's take a quick break and we'll be right back. Okay, hope you had a great break. Security practices in AWS. Let's figure out how and what and what services can apply to help us meet some of these control requirements as you figure out threat modeling issues and find and work your way around. Are we doing this safely? What about secure code review? What about infrastructure protection? All these need to be answered as part of the security pillar and design principles of Amazon Web Services. So our security pillar design principles include security foundations. And you might be scratching your head going, what does that really mean? Well, your security foundations means basic CIA, confidentiality, integrity, and availability. You're already meeting some of these based on things like having multiple um, AZ replication, multiple regions, going serverless whenever possible. But that's not all. You should also look at identity access management, which is what we have IAM and SSO Federation for. We have detection-based controls, infrastructure protection, which we talked about a little bit earlier, hence the EC2 instance that needed OS patching um, and other network security requirements, data protection, uh, CIA, which is confidentiality, integrity, and availability. How do we make sure that data has only the right people looking at it at the right time? And finally, we have instant response should a actual cybersecurity event true positive occur. This is all within the well-architected framework, and the security pillar is uh, has multiple security design principles, as you see to the left here. Identity access management, detective controls, infrastructure protection, data protection, um, and incident response. All these are operationally part of you, the actual DevOps responsibilities, not you as in you alone, but your entire organization that uses Amazon Web Service products. Remember, at the end of the day, AWS is required of security of the cloud. You are required of security in the cloud. So what kind of services support security requirements for AWS? Well, we have a few that we mentioned in previous lectures and modules. We have um, the IAM, which is free, uh, possibly the AWS directory services, and AWS organizations, which help you organize and create uh, really trust boundaries and really guardrails to determine maximum and minimum privileges. You also have detective controls like AWS CloudWatch, also known as Event Bridge at the time of this recording. This allows you to capture events based on logs and other details that come from multiple AWS related services. We also have Trust Advisor, which says, hey, here are some best practices for your password security and are you using encryption or not? We also have Infrastructure Protection, which we have Guard Duty, which is a machine learning uh, analysis for network security traffic issues. Uh, the Web Allocation Firewall from AWS, which is focused around preventive controls around um, attacks against your web application payloads. Your VPC, which offers security group and uh, network ACL-based security at the infrastructure level. 
And then finally, AWS Shield uh, by default is going to protect you from layer three and layer four based on all service attacks. If you need layer seven attack or layer five through seven based attack protection, you really want AWS Shield Advanced, which you have to pay for. It's really expensive, so you won't be utilizing this in this course. Data protection, you have AWS Macy, which acts as a data loss prevention analysis uh, tool, which can pu push events into AWS CloudWatch. KMS, which is Key Management Service, which says, hey, I can manage my own keys for encryption and decryption purposes. Um, Cloud HSM, which is the same thing, only in a hardware-based module dedicated to um, dedicated to you as a tenant. The Elastic Load Balancer, which performs uh, SSL termination for application load balancers um, and whatnot. You also have Incident Response, which is CloudTrail, uh, which provides a log of all the API calls that have happened in your account. Uh, CloudWatch Alarms, which are the same as the tech controls in the same case for, uh, here. And so you can actually set up automated responses, including uh, SNS for topics for uh, SM. SNS for topics for sending out SMS text messages, emails, or even launching uh, additional automatic responses and remediation, which will come up uh, later on in the lab section. You also have application protection, uh, which is technically AWS Web Application uh, Firewall and uh, Inspector. Now, Inspector itself is just a vulnerability scanner at the end of the day. So you leverage just anything EC2 related and will scan based on uh, the the CloudWatch agent or the inspector agent actually. And the inspector agent will have a series of vulnerabilities based on what it is. Your CloudWatch agent on the EC2 instance can monitor for other activities and send it to CloudWatch logs. So lots of different services to help out. These are just some of the few. There are many, many more that have security built-in features to help you out with your security pillar needs. Now, one of the first things is ID access management or IAM. Remember back to roles for a user, identity focused user, can utilize a role either in a different account or the same account and get STS assume role, which allows that trust session policy there. Get some uh, token credentials, which is the access key, secret access key, and the token session uh, triplet pair there. Send those back to the actual resource uh, for authorization and ultimately uh, the actions thereafter. The areas of focus of IAM is really identity management and permissions management. Now think back to what we talked about in a previous lecture. What does AAA mean? We have authentication, authorization, and accountability. Where does IAM fit in? I'll wait. Okay, hopefully you have that answer. Identity management itself is around identity users, right? Authentication for the most part. Permissions management, you could think of authorization. And of course you have accountability, which is not necessarily a part of IAM, but really, IAM sends events to CloudTrail. So anything that happens in the IAM side, the IAM will send events to CloudTrail. And that will provide that, that extra accountability for your AAA services. So really, you have the best of both worlds um, for making sure you meet the AAA standard um, for access to identity management. Next, you have detection, which sounds pretty straightforward, but how they actually get it done is a little bit more difficult and tricky. We had, we had talked about guard duty. Two main things is that you want to make sure you have unexpected configuration changes detected and unexpected or anomalous behavior, right? more than just the configuration, but actually behavior of a system or an application itself to track and monitor. For that, and what was not actually mentioned was AWS config, which is focused around security but mostly compliance of a particular configuration. You're gonna have configuration management rules and you can actually trigger a CloudWatch alarm and event and create automatic remediation actions based on that. So for instance, if your EC2 instance has not uh, been patched for over a month, you can have a uh, AWS config rule that monitors for that. And of course that costs all money because it's actually built out of AWS Lambdas. and has a bunch of rules easily made for you in the console itself. You can also be sure to actually think about it in terms of unexpected behavior or unwanted configuration by doing static code analysis of, of code in the CICD pipeline itself, which you'll learn later on. CICD means it's continuous integration and continuous deployment. And what that usually means is code goes in something, gets built up, gets scanned, has test cases ran, and if something's off, 
or, or, or weird with it, it would fail to build and not actually make it to production. So really important concepts that we need to detect things early on in the process as, as in too late and as as much automation as possible. Now, infrastructure protection is a little bit different. And it's really about the uh, focus around unwanted configuration and unexpected behavior as well. But you're actually focusing now on network security and OS systems hardening. Pretty interesting. Now, another service that wasn't mentioned in the re uh, previous slides is AWS Network Firewall, which also acts as an IPS. In fact, the, the engine behind that is Siricata, which is a fork off Snort. And if you've been watching carefully for any kind of network-based uh, lectures, Snort is actually a fork of TCP dump. So for those of you taking uh, additional modules or have done network engineering in the past, it's a really interesting traversal into uh, what has become AWS Network Firewall. So it actually acts as a firewall for the entire VPC and security groups and network ACLs. It takes over some of that, helps determine routing requirements, and also does payload inspection, hence intrusion prevention system. So unwanted uh, configuration and unexpected behavior, that's still detected, but you're also actually in a prevention mode now using the firewall as a layer of security between you and a lower zone of trust. You also have data protection. So you have to classify the data. You wanna focus on privacy requirements, which usually includes encryption. What do we mean by encryption? Well, we mean by SSL termination, of course, or TLS termination. So if your site doesn't say HTTPS, well, but if you don't support HTTPS, you can actually have a load balancer as a compensating control in front and have those certificates loaded and terminated for you so that uh, communication and privacy is always at the client level, but not necessarily internally, but at least you have a, a lot of control internally. You also want to focus on integrity requirements of that data. So you have to measure who changed what and when. Part of that AAA was the accountability portion of it and to understand if there was an actual change in the data, including the data classification changes itself and the model that goes with it. So privacy integrity requirements are all part of data protection. Make sure you have least privileged access whenever required and also make sure you have encryption at rest and in transit. Last but not least is incident response. So incident response is all about preparation, detection, containment, eradication, recovery, and lessons learned. This is a little bit different from NIST's, NIST cybersecurity framework incident response. And although it does overlap, it's very similar. This is actually known as the SANS original one. Um, and it, SANS is a community driven and community maintained security um, education facility for cybersecurity related folk. It also hosts a bunch of different certifications and this is actually one of the most popular incident response uh, steps even before the NIST cybersecurity framework came out. It's actually relatively new NIST CSF. So we wanna mature things whenever possible. We wanna make sure that part of incident response is good detection. Uh, so we wanna see uh, part of preparation is having good detection continue to begin with. Those skill sets, those analysis, those tool sets, and what you see here to the left is actually multiple accounts. You have a security account and a service account. The best practice is to always have a security account as part of your um, either a hub or another spoke and making sure it actually has centralized logging, centralized access, and the ability to do automatic response, hence the response portion of incident. Whenever you have all the above detection, protection, um, and other preparation controls, you have a really robust program and can actually do much more automation, much more automatic remediation to reduce the workload on your security staff. Now, that's it for now for this slide portion of it. Let's take a break and then we'll do a demo of automatic remediation. You should have learned a lot about how we can do threat modeling, how to apply alignments and controls around those alignments between the actual frameworks themselves and the framework of the AWS portion, and you consolidate the two, create a proposed architecture and diagram, model it, look for issues, and iterate until a lot of your risk is gone to an acceptable level. All right, we'll see you back when you uh, get back from your break and uh, do our demo. Hi, and welcome back. Hope you had a great break. We're, we're on to our demo now. 
one of the key pillars of security is that we want to automate everything possible. And for everything practical, surely you can use AWS Config, but when you look at the price point, if we look at AWS Config pricing, and even though we have monitoring and detection, we don't have automatic remediation that comes with it. And so we have, uh, and that's the first rule evaluation. So if you get really busy, this actually becomes really expensive really quickly. And so there's additional costs that go with it. And you, know, you really don't want the bill to be really difficult or high while you're experimenting. Fortunately, there's another solution and you can always use third-party solutions when they're possible. Um, Cloud Custodian is actually uh, a tool that was developed by uh, Capital One, which is one of AWS's customers. So uh, Cloud Custodian. And it's actually multi-cloud, um, so it's cloud agnostic. So when you think about it, you can actually use it for Azure, Google Cloud Platform. It's, it's really quite nice. So please take the time to go look at their quick start guide, download it up. You'll be using this in your lab um, and follow the instructions accordingly. We do have some sample bullet point boilerplate code for you, uh, but we want you to really understand what it does. So uh, what happens is once you install Cloud Custodian, it's actually an engine. Using your existing programmatic key credentials, whether you use SSL or not, uh, you can. it actually creates a temporary Lambda inside your VPC hidden to you and truly ephemeral. It creates it and then destroys it as soon as it's done making an action and scanning your account. So it's actually cheaper than AWS config because you're running it on your own schedule and you can actually run it on a cron job, which uh, can run every five minutes or even every one hour. And it's actually creating and destroying a Lambda. And your first uh, uh, definitely 100,000 invocations are free per month uh, for your first 12 months at least. So when you think about that, that's actually significantly cheaper. What we have here is an S3 bucket that I created. So do this test bucket tonight. I didn't put any objects in there and then we won't need them for that pers perspective. You can certainly follow along if you wish. And look, I'm not using any form of encryption. Uh, that's a bad dentist. I'm not doing data protection. Uh, and I want to make sure that I auto remediate it. So if I ever create a bucket, I would hope that a software tool will automatically force a correction on it without, and I can certainly get notified, but that's not enough. I don't want human intervention whenever possible. Humans make mistakes. And so we want to reduce the risk of a mistake or incident uh, before it even starts. So we want to make that correction to start with. So while we're here, I have a YAML policy, and that policy is designed to be uh, understanding that if there's an S3 bucket encryption policy absent, it's going to go ahead and change it back into using SSE, which is server-side encryption AES-256, and then tag it with uh, the key pair sec remediated. Now that seems really simple, but you can actually have really complex policies for you just doing this for the sake of demonstration here for your sample. Again, you want to have security and automation lockstep hand in hand. Remember, even, even though we talk about infrastructure as a code quite often in DevOps, you can also think about security as code. Rather than having just people, you can actually reduce your account and let them focus on what they need to do best, which is create more automation in most cases. And so security operations as code is also a term that I like to use whenever possible. Now that you understand what this rule looks like, remember that YAML uses spaces, not tabs. So you should always have for every space, two spaces over. Notice the spaces in here that is really required. So now that we have our rules together, which is in our test YAML, in, inside your lab, you're actually installed uh, Cloud Custodian, but I wanna show you a test run. So we wanna validate our, our script right here using the validate command with custodian. Looks pretty good to me. Then we'll wanna do a test, which is including the run command uh, and dry run fixtures here. And this creates the standard output to the same folder for the test YAML. I, mean, I have it specified my region. Notice that I'm using programmatic key credentials. You can use AWS SSO, as long as you have programmatic credentials and you specify the correct region. Again, I love to work out of US East 2. You're just, you decide which region you want to work with. We want to dry run, and we're saying, hey, we found one count of S3 in US East 2, uh, a bucket present that does not have encryption. Good. That's exactly what we have. Now that we've done our test one, let's make sure we can uh, actually run it. 
and it found something and it executed something in a certain amount of time. Let's go back here and refresh. And now if we go back to properties, we should see I have a tag that says remediated, which I can actually track um, how many bad configurations they were a part of. It also actually produces detection, automatic response, and really preparation and tracking. So all the best practices that we talked about inside the Amazon Web Service security pillar is part of this. And look, we forced enable encryption at the SSE S3 level, which means it's free encryption for me. KMS costs you money. And wow, that, that is completely automated. Now you can actually run that down here, or you can actually say uh, Cloud Custodian needs to run as a cron job based on CloudWatch events or a scheduled test. So uh, Cloud Custodian uh, scheduled run mode. And you can actually write a policy accordingly to that. Uh, so you want this to be in an execution mode. So we'll go to here, execution mode. And you can pull, use CloudTrail event logs, uh, config, AWS config if you wanted to work with that directly. Um, hub finding, many different things, but periodic uh, might be really interesting. And you can actually use a cron job to determine how often you want to run? Five minutes every one hour. And you can be as, as granular as you want with these policies. So it's really cool stuff. And we go back to CloudTrail events. We should see that we have Lambda related items here because Lambda was the actual one to actually make those corrections. So if we look at Lambda, we should see no other, other Lambdas in here because why? Well, that's the Lambda from my previous lecture, but it's not the one from the uh, Cloud Custodian event. That is the infimital Lambda. So let's go back to our CloudTrail events. When we look at our event history, tagging was already put on by my credential set, which is awesome. And it has a lot of these great feature sets already. And if we look at um, the resource type hints and we, set, we select Lambda, so you might be able to find uh, some evidence that it ran. So we have uh, some older ones here and then some event times. We have some update code functions here. Uh, let's see if that's one in the last 30 minutes. We don't have any. So it actually, it behooves you to actually look inside of your event ID. So we can actually look at different items. So we can look at um, event attributes by key or by user. I'll use username DW chow where all events in the last 30 minutes and it's still using my credentials, but it creates an actual ephemeral Lambda. Pull bucket tagging, which is awesome. And what we have is list buckets, so it's enumerating everything. And we have all these items here uh, that we've run accordingly. So the cool thing about all of this is that it's grabbing all of this and you can keep going through and describing all kinds of great stuff with it. Uh, at the end of the day, you really want to make sure that you're uh, getting all the capturing of the information as you want. So we'll just choose one event just for the sake of it. So we've got the Git tagging, um, Git website notification, and this is just uh, just really cool stuff. So let's look at Git bucket tagging. And we have a, a policy right here that is no tag sets exist. And we're just taking a look at the make sure and that our, our internal function that Cloud Custodian Engine was doing this on our behalf without any form of real coding on our end. Uh, it's, it's pretty neat. We look at the uh, read-only false, where we actually made some sort of changes. Encryption was put on, and it says it's by me, but it really wasn't. It was by uh, the actual engine itself. And so what happens is Cloud Custodian is the user agent utilizing its own SDK. It, it, with my permissions, it went ahead and utilized my permissions to create uh, SSE encryption enabled directly on the bucket at hand. Very cool. So uh, if ever in doubt, check out your CloudTrail laws and uh, CloudTrail event history uh, for the last 90 days or so, or you can create an actual trail, but that has to go into an S3 bucket and it gets charged money for it based on the number of bytes you have each month. That's it for today's lecture and demonstration. I hope you had a great time. We'll see you in the next lecture and uh, good luck in your labs.